Happy July, everybody. I'm not quite sure if I'm supposed to be relieved that we made it through half the year or bummed out that we still have six months left. Can't really tell. Anyway, this is the Maximize Your Medicare Weekly. That's my phone. No, Darth, I'm not giving in to the dark side, no. Anyway, I am the author of Maximize Your Medicare which happens to be the number one book on amazon.com for Medicare. Thank you so much to everyone for making that come true. Today, we're gonna to talk about a couple of important headlines. We're gonna talk about a couple of videos that are up there on the YouTube channel because they're very important to financial planning. With no further ado, we begin in three, two, one. The second set of video, this, I'm so bad at it. Hi everybody. Welcome to the Maximize Your Medicare Weekly. I'm Jay O. I'm the author of this book, Maximize Your Medicare, available by Allworth Press. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy pretty much anything on Amazon these days. Anyway, I thought we'd get right to it. In today's video, what you will see are two things. Number one is a group, a couple of updates on things in the current events news. And the second are highlights of a couple of videos that I just released on the YouTube channel. Very important for financial planning purposes and for those with disabilities. Okay, let's start with uh, COVID-19. And remdesivir is the name of the medication which has been approved and is produced by Gilead. They've also revealed the pricing. $3,120 for persons with insurance inside the hospital. So let's get a couple of things out of the way first. First of all, I think it's very, very clear that this is not going to win Gilead a lot of fans in the public. I'm not here to adjudicate whether or not, you know, it's rightful whether or not you know it's worth it, et cetera, et cetera. You know, those are nebulous concepts, soft concepts that I'm not really here to, like I said, judge. Uh, I can say that I don't think it's going to be a very popular price point for the public who is trying to, you know, obviously survive COVID-19, as well as you know, high prescription costs being the probably singular topic with surprise medical bills where you get bipartisan support in terms of, you know, price regulation. I'm not sure if this is going to do the pharmaceutical industry any favors on that re in that regard. What I'm not saying is that this is not the right price. I don't know. I am sure that they have pressures on them as all stakeholders, all stakeholders in the U.S. healthcare system have, okay? Whether you be a doctor, hospital, insurance company, big pharmaceutical, right? I don't presume, this book doesn't presume that any stakeholder is like just incompetent. Why? Why would he do that, right? The doctors are acting rationally. It costs a half a million dollars to become a medical doctor if you're now 19 years old. That's your tuition bill. Okay. If you're dealing, if you're in a rural hospital, you could be closed soon. If not, and you, and you I saw a headline the other day, something like 42 hospital systems have declared bankruptcy in the United States since the age of COVID-19. Someone big, some big stakeholder has very fundamental pressures. And so I'm not, that's why I say I'm not 
really in the camp of throwing a stone at Gilead or Big Pharma as a whole. Right. Let's move on to how people are affected. First of all, under Medicare, remember, COVID-19 testing is without copay. No copay. That means Medicare Advantage plans. That means original Medicare with Medigap. Both of you covered. If you are one of the few who should not have just Medicare Part A and Part B alone, and notice how I slipped that in there, still covered. The test is covered. Note, you need to have a doctor's order because, you, in other words, you, you and that's the practical reality because you need to be displaying symptoms. Well, the person to write it on a piece of paper to say you're displaying symptoms is a medical professional. If you satisfy that, then there's no copay for the test. Under Medicare, Medi like I said, under original Medicare, under Medicare Advantage, under Medigap, no problem. Now, remdesivir, that's slightly different, okay? The administration of the cost, this is strictly up to the carrier if under Medicare Advantage. Under Medicare Advantage, right? Now, the practical reality is many, many insurance companies have waived the cost of treatment for COVID-19 entirely. It was their, it was their ability to do so. Okay, so it's always safest to check what the copays will be. It's always safest to check. Reality is, is this is not going to fall under Part D. Because why? The medication is administered inside the healthcare setting. So in the same way that someone gets infusion therapy for, or you know, chemotherapy, for example, it is a drug, but it's also not taken at home. Right. So as a result, it doesn't get charged under Part D. It gets charged under Parts A and B. B, actually. The same thing can be said about Medigap. That since it's covered by Medigap, you first mark, must meet the Part B deductible. Normally, you'd be charged the 20% that Medicare, do, that Part B doesn't cover. Medigap will cover you. So your cost is zero. So you can understand the headline. $3,200, not a trivial amount of money for anyone. I understand that. However, covered at substantially different price points for persons who are on Medicare. For individual health insurance, different, different. Because you're not, you're charged in an a la carte way for basically everything that you're administered, right? You're administered for ho hospital charge, a test while in the hospital, a blood test for the hospital, reading your x-ray, remdesivir will be another line item, okay? So it will depend on your individual plan. There's gonna be a negotiated price. And from there, there's gonna be what your coinsurance would be and whether or not you've made the deductible, if you've already met the deductible. Couple of important, very important big groups that don't fall in this categories. Number one is there are employer plans that don't fit any of the descriptions I've just described. The card can say an insurance carrier that you recognize, but it's actually not a ACA compliant plan. Large employers largely do something they call self-funded plan. They're not necessarily going to follow any of the rules that I've stated over the last few minutes. They're not. They're not subject to the same rules. They're not subject to the same rules. As a result, the company is deciding how this is going to be handled. So you'll need to check with your HR department in order to find out how, what the actual cost sharing, whether that be copay or coinsurance, what applies to you. You're going to have to do that. Even if your card has an insurance company in the corner, that does not necessarily mean that's the way it gets paid for. That's a complicating factor for large employers. 
The second big group is the group of you that are on you know, shared health ministry groups. I don't even know what the right term is because candidly speaking, and I've told this to people on the podcast, I don't represent these plans. And I don't represent these plans because I'm not, I can identify the cost because the price is there and known, listed. I can't tell the conditions of which the payout exists, right? The cost is the cost. I can easily identify that, right? I call them up. I said, how much does it cost? I'm, you know, X years old. You know, I've got a spouse and then for six children, what, whatever your situation is, you can get a cost. However, the problem with these ministries is that on the back end, if you require health care, it's not a guaranteed certainty that you're going to actually get the benefits that you anticipated. It's not. And the second weakness to it is the fact that let's just say they, that there are 20 COVID patients and they paid out all the claims. They don't have the pots, the financial resources by which to pay. So it's not sure. And I'm not saying this is happening. Right. I'm, I'm not saying this is happening. What I am saying is there's a non-zero probability that this could happen. That could happen, right? So either you get denied after the fact without you knowing, or the company doesn't have the financial resources to pay. Either of those scenarios could occur. And for that reason, right, when I evaluate financial matters, I'm evaluating cost, of course, but just as importantly, okay, what are the terms and conditions of payout. How reliable? What situation? Can I see it in writing? What if this happens? What if that happens? Do I still get the payouts? This is the analysis you need to do. However, under these shared ministry groups, that doesn't necessarily exist in writing. There's small print. It says here are situations we won't pay, etc. And for that reason, I, as a professional person, as someone with a fiduciary responsibility to my clients, sorry, I don't end up representing those plants. Maybe it works out fine. I'm not saying that it's not. All I'm saying is that probability, which is non-zero, it is not zero, right, can come up and bite you at the time that you most need, which is the very point of insurance products that I end up advocating to clients around the country. Just a couple of words to be beware. So that's your story on remdesivir. I do understand, you know, I'm not going to settle the PR snafu. I'm not going to settle the PR debate about what's the proper price for drugs. Is it fair? Is it fair? That we could should have had, that debate should have been taken up well before the age of COVID-19. So let's talk about the Affordable Care Act. Um, you know, you can see the article there on your screen. It's an article from thehill.com. And, you know, this is not the only place where you can find this news. It's in a bunch of different places. The Affordable Care Act is a tax. It's a tax. How do I know it's a tax? Because I followed the cash flow, which just happens to be kind of my number one mantra, my number one set of guidance, rules, principles by which you can analyze any financial contract, any, any, whether it could be extended warranty on your refrigerator, dental insurance, Medicare, Affordable Care Act. It's a tax. How do I know it's a tax? Follow the cash flow. What cash flow? Number one, when you had the individual mandate, you have to pay. Everyone has to pay. Number two, you have higher income, you have to pay more for health insurance. Simple, okay? Looks like a tax, acts like a tax, it's a tax. Walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. It's not an elephant, it's a duck. So here's the thing, is that it's a tax it wasn't marketed as a tax. That was my objection to the Affordable Care Act. 
not what it was trying to do. I understand it. I tried to explain it to everyone on why you need the individual mandate because it held things together. Why? The 27-year-old has to pay for the 63-year-old, right? In other words, that cloned person who just happens to be 27 and then also simultaneously 63, one has a way higher probability of incurring healthcare costs. Simple. That's it. That's literally how this thing was held together. And that's the principle of insurance and how insurance gets works. Okay. Now, I'm not going to get into the nuances about no age tax, et cetera, et cetera, and fairness or socialism versus, you know, it's not fair versus baby killer. Let's leave out all of the politics. I'm not in, into politics. You already know that if you're a follower. Okay. I'm not here to settle our political differences. What I am here to do, though, is just to go through, in fact, what is going on. So, in fact, it was a tax. Let's presume for the moment you accept my explanation, it's a tax. Okay. The Supreme Court also gracefully, elegantly analyzed the Affordable Care Act and ruled, hey, I also call it a duck. I also know that ducks act and quack in that way, and so do taxes. This is a tax. Further, they said, you know what? Governments have the right to tax. And you know who, who enacts taxes? Legislatures. Congress enacts taxes. Are they right to do so? Are they empowered to do so? Who voted them in? You did. Okay. Who voted them out a couple of years later, right? That's why you lost, you know, the majority for the ruling party at the time. Why the long-winded explanation to, to this article that you see on your screen? It sets up the logic because since you were since the Trump administration was able to take away the individual mandate, they basically defanged the Affordable Care Act as a whole. And that formed the basis for this appeal to try to take down the Affordable Care Act as a whole. In other words, since the Supreme Court said it was a tax, and we kind of agree that it's a tax because it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck. Both. True. Since we don't have the requirement to pay this tax, the entirety falls apart. You know, and if I'm an opponent of the Affordable Care Act, this is, in fact, the method. This is, in fact, the line of reasoning I, too, would have used, which is, look, this is a tax. Since we voted out the tax, we should be able to vote out the entire thing. If I were an opponent, that's, in fact, the way that I would try to argue this. Apparently, legal there, you know, this article goes out and says that, you know, legal people, legal experts don't agree. And I'm not a lawyer. And I'm not a lawyer. Nor am I trying to pretend to give people legal advice. But just as common sense guy, I'm just a guy looking at stuff. That makes sense. If I, if I start out with the idea that I'm trying to get this thing banned from the, you know, law books, if you will from rules of the land, laws of the land, I guess is the phrase. Anyway, the fact is that this, for me, is not really the problem. It's, it's not really the problem that this is the line of reasoning used, okay? However, and you knew however is coming, right? However, that is different than having a solution, having a, having a viable, cohesive, working solution. We don't have one, okay? My arguments, my misgivings about the idea of repealing the Affordable Care Act is not the reasoning for the fact that the individual mandate and tax is off the books. My point is, okay, 
if you think you're going to be able to replace it, and if you do believe, and if you're trying to sell the idea that healthcare is important to the population, and that you're going to have the greatest healthcare ever, I want to see how this actually is going to work. I'm a practical guy, right? I'm like, okay, fine. You can call it an elephant if you like, and you can say it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. But how is how do the pieces of this elephant work? You know, how do all the components fit together? I could actually see how the Affordable Care Act fit together. There's a rationale. There's a mathematic rationale to that, right? Because again, I'm not here to settle political differences. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to do it, first of all. So I'm not even going to try to bite off more than I can chew. I wouldn't even dream of it. But what I am saying is, okay, fine. You don't like the Affordable Care Act. Fine. Tell me what you're going to do to replace it. And the reality is, is that I've seen the different planks about what we're going to do in order to place it, you know, components. None of them fit together. Either they didn't work independently or they didn't fit together or someone was, you know, detached from the way that insurance actually works, health insurance actually works in our country in order to say, okay, we're just going to be able to snap our fingers and sell across state lines. No, we're not. No, no chance. No chance. Why? Because the networks of Aetna in, you know, Illinois don't talk to the same networks that exist in Texas. So I'm just going to be able to go over there and sell into Texas if I'm based in Illinois. The amount of work that, and that was just a single aspect. This is a one single aspect. Oh, well, I'm going to increase in employment or, or competition as a result of being able to st sell across state lines. That was never going to work. Never. That was not going to work in our country the way, as is currently configured. My point is, is that we don't have a cohesive solution. And, you know, this should not be a shock to you because we find this in all sorts of, you know, aspects, complaints, suggestions for our country. We have no long-term care strategy at all, right? Medicaid is not a strategy, sorry. Medicare doesn't work, right? First 20 days only. That's not a long-term care strategy. And what you have is you've got people saying, okay, having, you know, yes, wishful thinking, we need a strategy and all we need to do is create this mandate to do this. Okay, so how are we going to pay? And, you know, and the, and the answers stop. In other words, you know, the explanations, you know, immediately cease. In the same way, so yes, you've got the administration who says, look, I don't like the Affordable Care Act. I'm trying to discredit, you know, you know, prior administrations, et cetera, et cetera. I get all of that. I get all of that. And it was a tax and that was the reasoning and therefore, et cetera. Okay. Nevertheless, the issue is what is going to actually replace it? What is actually going to replace it? And that's my issue with the existing headlines. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. You know, this has been filed. So more updates here on the Maximize Your Medicare Weekly. I'll be keeping people up to date on this one because lots of people have enrolled in health insurance due to the fact there are no pre-existing conditions. And it is true that if you strike down the Affordable Care Act and the clause and the clause inside the Affordable Care Act, which says no pre-existing conditions, that means lots of people would be forced out to plans they currently have. For today's Medicare section, we've got two videos and they've just been posted on YouTube over the past few days. The first one has to do with financial planning mistakes and health insurance slash Medicare. So you can remember for those people who watched the, the newsletter, the weekly last week, I had a section called see me after class. And there I was pointing out, look, there, there's something called Roth IRA conversion 
and it looks like a slam dunk, a no brainer. Well, maybe, maybe not. Even as a standalone item, I'm not entirely convinced because you know the market's going to do where the market's going to do, and the the Roth IRA presumption has a couple of assumptions that people just kind of gloss over and just go, oh yeah, well that's going to be obvious. Well, you know, if it were obvious, then shouldn't it already exist today? Anyway, even beyond that, to make things worse is the fact that there can be a financial mathematic error, a cash flow error, which makes it less efficient to convert into a to use the Roth IRA conversion. And if you do that, it does two things. Number one, it costs you money that you have to pay taxes and certainty today for a benefit that you're not yet sure that it's going to materialize. And then if you don't watch it because of that, because of the cash cost today, it makes the idea of the first assumption, which is the tax rates are going to be higher, a lot harder to beat. In other words, they're going to have to go way higher because of the fact that you're costing yourself extra money today. Anyway, Roth IRA conversion is just one sample. And the main takeaway for you is the following. Look, I'd love to tell you we're going to have this simple world. We're going to be able to keep, you know, topic one and topic three and topic seven and topic eight all separate into little buckets, convenient buckets that they're not going to mix together. We don't live in that world. We're not going back to that world. I don't know how to say it more bluntly to you than this. The issue though, of course, is that, not of course, the issue, told you it was bad at video. The issue is the fact that we, when you're talking to me, not, Jay specifically, because I'm going to try to catch this, right? But what happens is when you talk to expert and the expert prides him or herself as, look, I'm good at topic one and I don't care about topic five. You're the one in the middle. <laughs> I don't know any other way to say it nicely. That's as nice as probably is going to get, which is you're the one in the crossfire. Unless the person who happens to be expert in topic one is also cognizant, sensitive to the fact that there's topic five here and either admits, look, this is important and I may be out of my depth and I need to call someone else or they ignore it because they don't want to look bad in front of you because they know that topic five is out there and they know nothing about it and they're not telling it to you. I've got a separate issue there. Anyway, this first video deals with financial planning mistakes that can override, overwhelm whatever the article said. I'll be able to find it. It's not like the previous see me after class is the only sample I could possibly find. Promise you that one. The second video is about those persons who are eligible for Medicare as a result of being disabled. You can remember that most persons are eligible for Medicare on the first day of the month they turn 65. Well, there's a certain set of other persons who can get access to Medicare prior to reaching the age of 65. And by far the largest group of those persons are those persons who receive 24 months of Social Security disability insurance. For them, however, there are certain rules and certain things that you need to know when you get access to Medicare. Most importantly, that the late enrollment penalty, the ticker, the time clock has then begun, not be when you turn 65. In addition to that, there can be big opportunities and many people miss the huge opportunities because instead they stay on COBRA, they go on the employer, their, their spouse's employer plan, they buy health insurance from on the Affordable Care Act compliant plans, for example. These plans, while there are, you can enroll in them, 
can be wildly expensive compared to what you can get under Medicare. Check out the video. It's actually one of my favorite topics because so many people don't understand all of these nuances and people can benefit a huge amount if they just simply understand the rules. Sounds like the other topics on Medicare, right?